Welcome back to Tuesdays with Maury. Happy Valentine's Day. It's uh, February 14th, 2023. And it's quite interesting that our chapter today uh, is the 10th Tuesday and the 11th Tuesday, because we're going to do two chapters. Uh, the first is we talk about marriage. And Valentine's Day is about love, right? So today's challenge, um, remember how earlier on in the book we listed uh, a group of people or individuals that were mentors to us, that we looked up to, that we uh, um, would visit, uh, would see as a role model for us? An example. Well, today, now this might take a lot of time because I know it would for me. Make a list of all the people that you love. Wow, that might be a whole notebook, right? Because on Valentine's Day, people sometimes think, well, I need that special someone. But, you know, to be honest, we need a whole bunch of special someones in order to shape the life that we want. Because it's all about, well, it's supposed to be about the other person, the other people in our lives. And so how are we of service to them? I've recently started a, a, a course called the Accountability Program, Certification Program. But part of it is is called a pivot program, and they uh, Sam Silverstein believes and teaches that, as well as many other great teachers, that the less it's about me, the further we get. Right. So I could sit here all day long and complain that I don't have a special someone in my life. But instead, I can brag and say, I have many special people in my life. And they don't have to be people that are, that are currently living. So in your list, in your challenge today in writing all those things, on, on recording all their names, record people that might not be present to us anymore in, in, in uh, a physical sense. Um. The other point I wanted to make is that um, I could, you could stay in your head, I could stay in my head and say, oh, woe is me. I give myself a pity party and say, oh, I don't have that special someone. Or I could take action and do something different, you know, like make a list of all the people that I do love and that I have loved in the past. And if you want to do an extension on the challenge is you can write a sentence or two about um, something that relationship, that friendship, that love ship that you had with these different individuals. What did they teach you about love? Because Maury is teaching us a lot of lessons here. He could sit around and he he, once he got his diagnosis and um, played the woe is me game, instead, he invited people in to the experience, into his life. And he wanted to be consistent because as, we're, as we've come to find out in, in getting to know Maury, that's what his life was about, including people. You know, like the, when he was working at the job at the mental health institute or uh, hospital or whatever you want to call it. And the one woman that would come out every day and lay down in the middle of the hallway and people would walk around her. And he chose to do something different. He chose to sit with her. So today on Valentine's Day as you make your list of people that you love, 
sit with them. Sit with each and every one of them and honor them. Honor the, the friendship and the love ship that you had, have, had, have, will have with them and uh, recall uh, what you have learned from them. That's the, that's the, that's the uh, extended extension to the challenge. So you don't have to do that part. You actually don't have to do any of it, but I think that uh, we're all rewarded by having special people in our lives. Right. And why not relive those things? Remember how Maury kept on saying I've, he, he could, he could go throughout, the different ages um, because he's already lived them. So let's get on with reading. I know we're here to read, right? Okay. I, I think we're here to talk too. So uh, I'm going to, I, I, I've been negligent in putting my email address underneath, but I'll put it in the description today so that if you'd like to reach out and wish me a happy Valentine's day, then we'll do that. And I can, I can respond. And send you a happy Valentine's Day. Okay. And hopefully you got your hot drink. Today I've got my coffee again. It's, uh, it's back from my walk with the dogs. Bruno went swimming this morning. And then he tries to shake off when he's still in the water. It's like he's not getting it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to teach him, like, look, if you want to, if you're going to shake off to get drier, you got to get out of the water first. Uh, and then Bella got a little bit wet because she tries to get him and barks at him and reaches out, but she doesn't like water. So she just stands on the edge. Those two. Okay, and a little bit of a drink and then we're going to read. I know I said we were going to start reading. Mm, good coffee. The 10th Tuesday. We talk about marriage. I brought a visitor to meet Maury. My wife. He had been asking me since the first day I came. When do I meet Janine? When are you going to bring her? I'd always had excuses until a few days late earlier when I called his house to see how he was doing. It took me a while for Maury to get to the receiver. I'm sorry. It took a while for Maury to get to the receiver. And when he did... I could hear the fumbling as someone held it to his ear. He could no longer lift a phone by himself. Hi, he gasped. Uh, you doing okay, coach? I heard him exhale. Mitch, <clears throat> your coach isn't having such a great day. His sleeping time was getting worse. He needed oxygen almost nightly now, and his coughing spells had become frightening. One cough could last an hour, and he never knew if he'd be able to stop. He always said he would die when the disease got his lungs. <sighs> I shuddered when I thought how close death was. I'll see you on Tuesday, I said. You'll have a better day. Well, it actually, it actually said, you'll have a better day then. Mitch! Yeah? Is your wife there with you? She was sitting next to me. Put her on. I want to hear her voice. Now... I am married to a woman blessed with far more intuitive kindness than I. Although she had never met Maury, she took the phone. I would have shaken my head and whispered, I'm not here, I'm not here. And in a minute, she was connected with my old professor as if they'd known each other since college. I sensed this, even though all I heard on my end was, uh-huh. Mitch told me. Oh, thank you. When she hung up, she said, I'm coming your next trip. And that was that.
Now we sat in his office, surrounding him in his recliner. Maury, by his own admission, was a harmless flirt, and while he often had to stop for coughing or to use the commode, he seemed to find new reserves of energy with Janine in the room. He looked at photos from our wedding, which Janine had brought along. You are, you are from Detroit? Maury said. Yes, Janine said. I taught in Detroit for one year in the late 40s. I, I remember a funny story about that. He stopped to blow his nose. When he fumbled with the tissue, I held it in place and he blew weakly into it. I squeezed it lightly against his nostrils, then pulled it off like a mother does to a child in a car seat. Thank you, Mitch. He looked at Janine. My helper, <laughs> this one. Anyhow, my story. There were a bunch of sociologists at the university and we used to play poker with other staff members, including this guy who was a surgeon. One night after the game, he said, Maury, I want to come see you at work. I said, fine. So he came to one of my classes and watched me teach. After the class was over, he said, all right now, how would you like to see me work? I have an operation tonight. I wanted to return the favor, so I said, okay. He took me up to the hospital. He said, scrub down, put on a mask, and get into a gown. And next thing I knew, I was right next to him at the operating table. There was this woman, the patient, on the table, naked from the waist down. And he took a knife and went, zip, just like that. Well, Maury lifted a finger and spun it around. Uh, I started to go like this. <laughs> I'm about to faint. All the blood. Yuck. The nurse next to me said, What's the matter, doctor? And I said, I'm no damn doctor. Get me out of here. We laughed. And more he laughed, too, as hard as he could with his limited breathing. It was the first time in weeks that I could recall him telling a story like this. How strange, I thought, that he nearly fainted once from someone else's illness. And now he was so able to endure his own. Connie knocked on the door and said that Maury's lunch was ready. It was not the carrot soup and vegetable cakes and Greek pasta I had brought that morning from Bread and Circus. Although I tried to buy the softest of foods now, they were still beyond Maury's limited strength to chew and swallow. He was eating mostly liquid supplements with perhaps a bran muffin tossed in until it was mushy and easily digested. Charlotte would puree almost everything in a blender now. He was taking food through a straw. I still shopped every week and walked in with bags to show him, but it was more for the look on his face than anything else. When I opened the refrigerator, I would see an overflow of containers. I guess I was hoping for, or I'm sorry, I was hoping that one day we would go back to eating a real lunch together and I could watch the sloppy way in which he talked while chewing the food spilling happily out of his mouth. This, this was a foolish hope. So, <clears throat> Janine, Maury said. She smiled. You are lovely. Give me your hand. She did. Mitch says that you're a professional singer. Yes, Janine said. He says you're great. Oh, she laughed. No, he just says that. Maury raised his eyebrows. Will you sing something for me? Now, 
I have heard people ask this of Janine for almost as long as I've known her. When people find out you sing for a living, they always say, sing something for us. Shy about her talent and a perfectionist about conditions, Janine never did. She would politely decline, which is what I expected now. Which is when she began to sing. And I'm not going to sing this because I don't even know the melody, but this, these are the words that she said. <laughs> the very thought of you, and I forget to do, the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'll say it one more time. The very thought of you, and I forget to do, the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. That's the best you're going to get from me. It was a 1930s standard written by Ray Noble, and Janine sang it sweetly. Probably much better than I did. She was looking straight at Maury. I was amazed, once again, at his ability to draw emotion from people who otherwise kept it locked away. Maury closed his eyes to absorb the notes. As my wife's loving voice filled the room, a crescent smile appeared on his face. And while his body was stiff as a sandbag, you could almost see him dancing inside it. Oh, here she goes. She's continuing to sing. <laughs> I'm... I see your face in every flower, your eyes and stars above. It's just the thought of you, the very thought of you, my love. It's interesting that our challenge today is to write down everyone that we love or have loved. When she finished, Maury opened his eyes and tears rolled down his cheeks. In all the years I have listened to my wife sing, I never heard, I never heard her the way he did at that moment. Okay, I'm a little choked up here because I'm thinking about envisioning this happening. Marriage. Almost everyone I knew had a problem with it. Some had problems getting into it. Some had problems getting out. My generation seemed to struggle with the commitment, as if it were in an alligator from some murky swamp. I had gotten used to attending weddings, congratulating the couple, and feeding only mild surprise when I saw the groom a few years later sitting in a restaurant with a younger woman, whom he introduced as a friend. You know, I'm separated from so-and-so, he would say. Why do we have such problems? I asked Maury about this. Having waited seven years before I proposed to Janine, I wondered if people my age were being more careful than those who came before us, or simply more selfish? Well, I feel sorry for your generation, Maury said. In this culture, it's so important to find a loving relationship with someone because so much of the culture does not give you that. But the poor kids today, either they're too selfish to take part in a real loving relationship or they rush into marriage and then six months later, they get divorced. They don't know what they want in a partner. <laughs> they don't know who they are themselves. So how can they know who they're marrying? Okay, time for a drink real quick. He sighed. Maury had counseled so many unhappy lovers in his years as a professor. It's sad because a loved one is so important you realize that, especially when you're in a time like I am, when you're not doing so well. 
friends are great, but friends, friends are not going to be here on the night when you're coughing and can't sleep and someone has to sit up all night with you, comfort you, try to be helpful. Okay, there's that tear that was coming earlier. Charlotte and Maury, who met as students, had been married 44 years. I watched them together now. When she would remind him of his medication or come in and stroke his neck or talk about one of their sons, they worked as a team, often needing no more than a silent glance to understand what the other was thinking. Charlotte was a private person, different from Maury, but I knew how much he respected her because sometimes when he spoke, he would say, Charlotte might be uncomfortable with me revealing that, and he would end the conversation. It was the only time Maury held anything back. I've heard this much about marriage, he said now. You get tested, you find out who you are, who the other person is, and how you accommodate or don't. Is there some kind of rule to know if a marriage is going to work? Maury smiled. <laughs> Things are not that simple, Mitch. I know. Still, he said, there are a few rules I know to be true about love and marriage. If you don't respect the other person, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you don't know how to compromise, you're going to have a lot of trouble. If you can't talk openly about what goes on between you, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And if you don't have a common set of values in life, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Your values must be alike. And the biggest one of those values, Mitch? Yes. Your belief in the importance of your marriage. He sniffed, then closed his eyes for a moment. Personally, he sighed, his eyes still closed. I think marriage is a very important thing to do, and... You're missing a hell of a lot if you don't try it. He ended the subject by quoting the poem he believed in like, he believed in like a prayer. Love each other or perish. Okay, this is a flashback or added on story, something or other at the end of the chapter. Okay, question, I say to Maury. His bony fingers hold his glasses across his chest, which rises and falls with each labored breath. What's the question? He says. Remember the book of Job from the Bible? Right. Job is a good man, but God makes him suffer to test his faith. I remember takes away everything he has, his house, his money, his family, his health, makes him sick to test his faith. Right, to test his faith. So I'm wondering, what are you wondering? What you think about, what do you think about that? Maury coughs violently. His hands quiver as he drops them by his side. I think, he says, smiling, God overdid it. The 11th Tuesday, we talk about our culture. Hit him harder. I slapped Maury's back. Harder. I slapped him again. Near his shoulders. Now, down lower. Maury, dressed in pajama bottoms, lay in bed on his side, his head flush against the pillow, his mouth open. The physical therapist was showing me how to bang loose the poison in his lungs, which he needed done regularly now, to help it from solidifying, to keep him breathing. 
I <coughs> always knew <coughs> you wanted to hit me. Maury gasped. Yeah, yeah, I joked as I wrapped my fist against the alabaster skin of his back. This is for the B you gave me my sophomore year. Whack! We all laughed. Well, a nervous laughter that comes when the devil is within earshot. It would have been cute, this little scene, were it not what we all knew it was. The, vi the final calisthenics before death. Maury's disease was now dangerously close to his surrender spot, his lungs. He had been predicting he would die from choking, and I could not imagine a more terrible way to go. Sometimes he, he would close his eyes and try to draw the air up into his mouth and nostrils, and it seemed as if he were trying to lift an anchor. Outside, it was jacket weather, early October. The leaves clumped in piles on the lawns around West Newton. Maury's physical therapist had come earlier in the day, and I usually excused myself when nurses or specialists had business with him. But as the weeks passed and our time ran out, I was increasingly less self-conscious about the physical embarrassment I wanted to be there. I wanted to observe everything. This was not like me. But then, neither were a lot of things that had happened since these last few months in Maury's house. I slipped a sense in there. But it wasn't really in the book. but So I watched the therapist work on Maury in the bed, pounding the back of his ribs, asking if he could feel the congestion loosening within him. And when he, and when she shook, I'm sorry, and when she took a breath, she asked if I wanted to try it. I said, yes. Maury, his face on the pillow, gave a little smile. Not too hard he said. I'm an old man. I drummed on his back and sides, moving around as she instructed. I hated the idea of Maury's lying in bed under any circumstances. His last aphorism, when you're in bed, you're dead, rang in my ears. And curled on his side, he was so small, so withered, it was more a boy's body than a man's. I saw the paleness of his skin, the stray white hairs, the way his arms hung limp and helpless. I thought about how much time we spend together to shape our bodies, lifting weights, crunching sit-ups, and in the end, nature takes it away from us anyhow. Beneath my fingers, I felt the loose flesh around Maury's bones and I thumped him hard, as instructed. The truth is, I was pounding on his back when I wanted to be hitting the walls. Mitch! Maury gasped, his voice jumpy as a jackhammer as I pounded on him. Uh-huh! When did I <coughs> give you a B? Maury believed in the inherent good of people, but he also saw what they could become. People are only mean when they're threatened, he said later that day. And that's what our culture does. That's what our economy does. Even people who have jobs in our economy are threatened because they worry about losing them. And when you get threatened, you start looking out only for yourself. You start making money a god. <laughs> it is all part of this culture. He exhaled. Which is why I don't buy into it. I nodded at him and squeezed his hand. 
we held hands regularly now. This was another change for me. Things that before would have made me embarrassed or squeamish were now routinely handled. The catheter bag connected to the tube inside him and filled with greenish waste fluid lay by my foot near the leg of his chair. A few months earlier, it might have disgusted me. It was inconsequential now. So was the smell of the room after Maury had used the commode. He did not have the luxury of moving from place to place, of closing a bathroom door behind him, spraying some air freshener when he left. This was his bed. There was his chair. And that was his life. In my life, oh, I'm sorry, if my life were squeezed in such a thimble, I doubt I could make it smell any better. Here's what I mean by building your own little subculture, Maury said. I don't mean you disregard every rule of your community. I don't go around naked, for example. I don't run through red lights. The little things I can obey. But the big things, how we think, what we value, those you must choose yourself. You can't let anyone or any society determine those for you. Take my condition. <coughs> the things I am supposed to be embarrassed about, not being able to walk, not being able to wipe my ass, waking up some mornings wanting to cry. <clears throat> There's something innately embarrassing or shaming about them. Uh, it's the same for women not being thin enough or men not being rich enough. It's just what our culture would have you believe. But don't believe it. I asked Maury why he hadn't moved somewhere else when he was younger. Where? I don't know. Uh, South America. New Guinea. Some place that's not as selfish as America. Oh, every society has its own problems, Maury said, lifting his eyebrows. The closest he could come to a shrug. The way you to do it, I think, isn't to run away. You have to work at creating your own culture. Look, <clears throat> no matter where you live, the biggest defect we humans have is our short-sightedness. We don't see what we could be. We should be looking at our potential, stretching ourselves into everything we can become. But if you've surrounded, but if you're surrounded by people who say, I want mine now, you end up with a few people with everything and a military to keep the poor ones from rising up and stealing it. Maury looked over my shoulder to the far window. Sometimes you could hear a passing truck or a whip of the wind. He gazed for a moment at his neighbor's houses, then continued. <laughs> the problem, Mitch, is that we don't believe we are as much alike as we are. Whites and blacks, uh, Catholics and Protestants, men and women. <clears throat> if we saw each other as more alike, we might be very eager to join in one big happy I'm sorry, one big human family in this world and to care about that family the way we care about our own. But believe me, <clears throat> when you are dying, when you're dying, you see it is, is true. We all have the same beginning, birth, and we all have the same end, death. So how can we be different? I'm sorry. Actually, he says, so how different can we be? Invest in the human family. Invest in people. Build a little community of those you love and who love you. 
He squeezed my hand gently. I squeezed back harder. And like that carnival contest where you bang a hammer and watch the disc rise up the pole, I could almost see my body heat rise as Maury's chest and neck into his cheeks and eyes. He smiled. In the beginning of life, when we are infants, we need others to survive, right? And at the end of life, when you, you get like me, you need others to survive, right? His voice dropped to a whisper. But here's the secret. In between, we need others as well. Late that afternoon, Connie and I went into the bedroom to watch the O.J. Simpson verdict. It was a tense scene as the principals all turned to face the jury. Simpson, in his blue suit, surrounded by a small army of lawyers, the prosecutors who wanted him behind bars just a few feet away. When the foreman read the verdict, Not guilty! Connie shrieked. Oh my God! We watched as Simpson hugged his lawyers. We listened as the commentators tried to explain what it all meant. We saw crowds of blacks celebrating in the streets outside the courthouse and crowds of whites sitting stunned inside restaurants. The decision was being hailed as momentous, even though murders take place every day. Connie went out in the hall. She had seen enough. Uh, as an aside, just last night at the uh, Michigan State University, there were there was a mass shooting again. Twenty twenty three. I heard the door to Maury's study close. I stared at the TV set. Everyone in the world is watching this, I told myself. Then, from the other room, I heard the ruffling of Maury's being lifted from his chair, and I smiled. As the trial of the century reached its dramatic conclusion. My old professor was sitting on the toilet. Okay, this is a, this is a flashback because it, it begins with, it was in 1979. It was in 1979, a basketball game in the Brandeis gym. The team is doing well and the student section begins a chant. We're number one, we're number one. Maury is sitting nearby. He is puzzled by the cheer. He rises and yells, What's wrong with being number two? The students looked at him. They stopped chanting. He sits down, smiling and triumphant. Okay, that brings us to the end of this chapter. And I'm going to be honest, uh, I'm going to probably cry a little bit later because I'm, I was fighting back crying today a little bit when I was reading some of this. So again, think about those you love today and think about that, that what was, what Maury was saying about the secret, but here's the secret. In between, in between, after we become, after we were dependent as children and as we become dependent as elderly folk, in between that time, we need others as well. So see what you can, how you can be of need and of service to someone else today. Be better, do better. Did I get that right? I think so.
We'll see you next time. And I tell you, the book is coming to an end. And we all know what that means. <laughs>